Jack Thorne. You are an award-winning screenwriter, playwright. You create at the same time for television, radio, theater, and film. To mention some, you are known for TV shows such as Shameless, Skin, This is England, The Fate, The Last Panthers, Don't Take My Baby, Carrie, The Accident, National Treasure. You have even penned the stage play for the West End sensation Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. You have written feature films like The Scouting Book for Boys, War Book, A Long Way Down, The Iron Outs, and Wonder. You are a true creative wonder in my eyes. And I wonder how many titles did I miss right now? <laughs> It's crazy. How do you manage to do all this stuff? And at the same time, we go with help. I mean, we're going to talk about that. What are you doing to have so much energy? I am very greedy uh, because I feel very, very lucky. And I'm desperate to get in as much as I can before people discover what a charlatan I am. And so I work very, very hard uh, in order to get as much stuff in as possible. Uh, before I'm thrown out of this industry uh, uh, with my tail between my legs. Um, and I want to start, of course, thanking you for being with us. And I want to congratulate you to start with for that impacting speech at the Mac Taggart lecture that you did at the um, Edinburgh Festival. Uh, you addressed the audience, condemning the fact that uh, the support for disabled people is lacking in the entertainment business. I was totally touched, I actually cried at the end of it. Um, how do you feel after that? And how, how have the reactions been after your speech in Edinburgh? I'm a very shy person and not someone that really belongs on stage. I, I'm a writer for a reason. I like being in the background. Um, but I was given this opportunity and given this platform and I've been working in the disabled world. I was a disabled person. I'm a member of the disabled community and I've been working in it for 20 years. And the frustration that I encounter sitting on panels, um, trying to get work made, dealing with other disabled creatives and seeing how they're treated by the industry um, is really, really, it, it, it's uh, devastating. And it, you know, and it's been something that, um, one of the interesting things about the speeches i've heard a lot from the industry i've also heard a lot from other disabled creatives and the the, the stories i've heard are almost even worse you know that that just like um and 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 it's been going on for a very very long time and what covid did more than anything else um i think is illustrate the ableism that's around us and the way that disabled people were dismissed and the way that disabled people were left to die in in our country um of the first 100,000 deaths 60,000 of them were disabled so that's 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 an astonishing statistic um and i feel like tv's got a responsibility i love tv um and i felt like this was the moment to sort of step forward and say we need to change this the, the the time has come to change and i didn't much enjoy doing it um but um i'm very happy with the reaction it's had you know we're just at the start of it we hope that that reaction gets doubled down on but um you know commitments from netflix from the bbc i've heard from amazon uh channel four have been amazing you know that the, the, uh, sky are looking into things that the, 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 in in the uk industry it, it seems to have provoked a real conversation and that's what i wanted beyond anything else well, i want to thank you for all these disabled people too because it was it was actually i would love the entire entire europe to really listen to that speech so i hope that people that are listening to this interview will go into youtube and listen to that speech um, well, and it's undoubtedly true that, it, that, that what's true in the uk is true in countries all over the world course, you know that I, i've been course. speaking to um uh american creators from the one in four coalition since um since the speech and we've just been sharing stories about what's going on over there and what's going on over here and um and i'm sure the same is true of france germany i'm sure that that that, that all these places with thriving tv industries um are, are all making the same mistake in terms of uh, disabled content um apart from 
playwright and screenwriter and, and in the same topic, you are Grai patron. Tell us a little bit about Grai and Crips Without Constraints, because I think it's a very interesting realization. Um, it's lovely to talk about that. I never get a chance to talk about that. So uh, Grey Eye are a, a disabled theatre company in the UK. Um, I've been involved with them um, for most of my adult life. Uh, the, 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 the moment when I um, first uh, felt comfortable as a disabled person was at a Grey Eye Open Day, where I was there with my condition and I said, I'm not sure whether I belong here. And and there's this wonderful woman um, uh, called Alex Bormer and she, she, she talked to me and she said, of course you belong. And that feeling of belonging has never really left me. And Grey Eye um, make theatre in a way that's completely inclusive and they make incredible theatre. Um, and I've made I made a I've made a a, a a play for radio with them. I've made a play for the stage with them. Um, and uh, and and I'm now involved as a patron, supporting them generally with Crits Without Constraints. At the start of the pandemic, right at the beginning, um, I emailed Jenny Seeley, who's the artistic director there, and said, "What can we do? And how can I help?" And uh, they very brilliantly came up with the with the, this idea that was. Um, disabled creatives writing for um, disabled talent um, and putting them on the internet. That, that at a time when uh, disabled people were, a lot of disabled people were shielding, it was a way of just um, getting work made and getting work made um, that spoke to the, the condition we were all in. And it was an extraordinary process. Um, talking to people, talking to people that were on their own 24 hours a day, mm. um, uh, that were going through extreme medical hardship and were being told that they, um, that the, the medical care available to them might be very limited. And to just be part of that community at that time was really, um, was, was uh, really moving and, um, and a real responsibility, uh, but 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 um, yeah, it was an incredible process. And this year, you're working hard now. There's a lot of productions coming going coming out of there. Uh, it's it's still very active, isn't it? Oh, Grey Eye, yeah, no, Grey Eye, Grey Eye, Grey Eye are, are amazing. They'll keep making work forever, um, and they are now um, talking about getting back into theatres, which is the you know the 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 most important thing uh for a theater company but um is all very i mean the theater industry is struggling to navigate this crisis of course it is if we go into your writing i write if i ask you like the simple question how did you learn to write i mean when did you start writing how did you become jack thorne <laughs> uh, I, I haven't worked that last question out at all um uh that um i um I, I went to university. I went to university intent on becoming a politician or a um, or an actor, and uh, and I discovered that I didn't really like anyone else in politics, and that I was not a very good actor, and so I lost my confidence a bit, and I tried to work out what else I could do, and I decided I was going to direct a play, and the rights for a play are quite expensive it was 65 pounds a night and i didn't have 65 pounds a night so i decided to write a play and then fell in love and from that moment i've never stopped writing it was it, you know i think i was 19 years old and i just uh, that was it as soon as i as soon as i found it it was like something shifted inside my brain and it was like oh this is this is where you belong and um uh i yeah look at you that didn't have that money to start and you found yourself directly Yes. Uh, you lucky man, you sit down by your computer at 845, I've done a lot of research about you. I <laughs> love to write, you have no struggle with lack of motivation, I can't believe that. And I, and then you say, which I think is so much fun, you say that insecurity is the useful motor, and I love that. What makes you insecure? Oh, exactly what I was talking about earlier, that 
that I, I think, and I think imposter syndrome is true for every creative in our industry. You know, that, that feeling of, I don't belong here. I mean, I, I think the ones that feel they do belong here probably aren't making any work. Um, I, I feel immensely lucky. I feel immensely privileged. And like most people, I think I don't deserve that luck or that privilege. And so that's my motor more than anything else. You know, that that the, it's the it's the lying awake at 3 a.m. going, why did I say that? Um, why? Uh, why did I let myself down there? Why did I submit that? You know, all those things, those questions that never quite let you go. And um, and that nervous energy, I think, is is a powerful propeller. Um, I'm sure I'm due for a complete, I've already had one nervous breakdown when I was 20, but I'm sure I'm due for a complete nervous breakdown, you know, in a few years. But um, until that point, I'll keep making stuff. Who is your best, best judge, Jack? Who gives you like the, okay, now you have to go back to this side or, or who reads your script and gives you the best feedback? My wife is my most brutal judge. And, um, and okay. there's still stuff that Rachel um, gave up on on episode two of my work. She just went, oh, I don't want to watch that anymore. And uh, and to have, uh, you know, the person you love saying that is quite a thing. Um, in terms of who gives me the best notes, uh, and this sort of leads on to help, I, I do think um, George Faber, who runs The Forge, and who I made uh, National Treasure, Kiri and the accident with, and this is our fourth collaboration, is just brilliant at killing me with a note. And he is a very, very brutal guy and a very, very soft and loving guy. And the two things sort of exist at the same time. He is just as worried as I am, just as insecure as I am. He's been making TV at a ridiculously high quality for a very, very long time. And yet his love of it hasn't dimmed. And uh, on help, when I first started talking to him about it, I was talking about it in relation to, it's important to tell a story about care homes because of what's going on, but I don't want to do a story about COVID. And uh, a day later, he said, it's a really interesting project, but you have to make it about COVID. You can't not make it about COVID. You're running from something that you're scared of. And I understand why you're scared, but you can't be scared of this. There is there is a story to be told here. It's an important story and you must tell it. And George has sort of done that to me all my career. And uh, he was also the executive on Skins and Shameless back in the day. So I would probably put George at the top of that tree. But there are lots of people. There are lots of amazing people. And the industry is full of brilliant, brilliance. And um, and I'm very lucky to be surrounded by brilliant people all the time. I wonder, I know that you don't want to be specifically um, related to one genre. And I've seen many of your series, some of your work. And you're an amazing entertainer you make us cry you make us laugh emotions come from every line you write and at the same time you're a social realist you are you can put a murder in between and make us intrigued i mean there's so many genres in one episode of anything you do if i force you to say what are you best at what would your genre be please jack answer um it's somewhere between fantasy and social realism um and personally i think fantasy and social realism have a lot in common i think both are about asking big questions about society and so i've always loved both and i've always watched both and if i'm given you know 50 films to watch um, you know, the, 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 the first 10 will be either fantasy or, or, or social realism. And so it, it, they seem like they don't belong together. But for me, that thing of going, what society do we live in? What society do we want to live in? Both, both genres ask those questions. And I love them both for it in different ways. What has been the toughest start for you to write? I mean, which series... Uh, you know, the ask because you really have a purpose when you write, you really have a meaning with everything you do. Of all these stories you've written, all the all the series we've seen, all the films we've what what the 
tough start for you. Which one was the one that you thought, Jesus, this is not going to work, and it did work at the end? I, I think every every everything feels like that. There's very few mm -hmm. where you go, this was easy from start to finish. And uh, I think that the reason why we're able to do it again is that we're very good at forgetting. So we go through it, yeah. and then we go, oh, that wasn't so bad. Uh, because we don't, we don't, um, we don't look back, you know, I don't keep a diary, because I don't want to know how I feel, you know, that I, I sort of am very comfortable with saying, uh, looking back in retrospect, through, with, with rose tinted glasses, um, help was extraordinarily difficult to write. Uh, the, the, the weight of responsibility, um, and the fact that we were being told things that we didn't know how to do. Um, so every single one of them. Uh, but I would say help because it's probably the most recent. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 but but honestly, it, it, you could name any projects and I could go, oh, no, no, there was the moment when the wheels fell off there and it was awful. It was really awful, you know. So giving birth to kids, it's like they say that if men would give birth to kids, there would only be one, <laughs> one kid per family, always. Um, I understand that. Uh, tell me something about, let's go into health directly, because that show is amazing. It's, it's very, as you say, it's like the latest show, it's coming up now. Um, it's a one-off, it's a film. Uh, tell us, pitch it to me and um, tell us about it. So it's a, a film about uh, a care home um, and specifically about a relationship between someone that is very new to the profession uh, and is just coming in and uh, a man with young onset Alzheimer's. Uh, she's played by Jodie Comer, he's played by Stephen Graham. And that, and that relationship is sort of the story of the film. It's about someone finding their vocation because I think she does in this. She's she's someone that the education system has not been great for and who's never really found somewhere where she could put her feet under the table. And then she finds this and she realizes she's really good at it. And in this home, Bright Sky Homes, uh, she finds an amazing man, Steve, Stephen's character, Tony, uh, who is from the same sort of place she is. You know, never really got on at school, never really found his way in life and now has had this disease um, uh, do damage to him. And as they're finding each other, as they're growing together, uh, COVID hits and the care home is thrown into disarray. And we see the horror of what happened to care homes during this pandemic, uh, the lack of support given, uh, the way that care homes were abandoned um, through mainly through government policy um, and left to uh, rot and people were left to die in those homes. And you see these two characters, uh, Sarah and Tony, desperately trying to navigate their way through these incredibly choppy waters. Tell me about In, in Help, uh, you choose, because you were talking about it in the beginning, Jody and Stephen, they, Stephen came with you, to you with saying, let's do something for us two together. Can you tell us about that a little bit again? Yeah, so this is the, this is the fifth thing I've made with Stephen. We made um, this thing in 86, 88, 90, and we made The Virtues together. And he is an actor I love. I think the whole world loves him, um, with very Absolutely. good reason. He's, he is astonishing. And we were sitting together at an awards do, and he said, Come on. And Stephen is a force of nature, you know, that he just he never stops moving. He never stops doing things. And he just he just basically got me in a headlock and said, write something for me and Jodie Comer. Now, <laughs> that's the greatest offer any writers ever had. Right. So uh, and, and the two of them are very good friends, but they haven't worked together since they first met, which is on this um, TV show, Good Cop. Um, and that was the start of Jodie's career. Stephen then placed Jodie with his agent and Jodie became an international superstar. Jody had also talked to me a little bit about writing something for her um, just generally on Twitter. So it was a really sort of brilliant bit of happenstance. I then tried to think of something that was good enough for the pair of them and I could think of nothing. I looked back into Liverpool's <laughs> history. I tried to find anything that just felt like it had something to say. And then the pandemic happened 
and um, I'm from, uh, well, I'm not from, I lived in a town called Luton for eight years and there was, um, there was a newspaper called Luton Today and Luton Today uh, talked about a care home in which an astonishing amount of people died. And it was right at the beginning. And I said, okay, why has this happened? What's, what's happening here? And I started investigating and the whole thing sort of went from there. And then uh, Jody comes in from Villanette to becoming this wonderful carer, Sarah. Tony really plays is amazing. I mean, I cannot tell so much because the series is coming out now. And um, which of the two characters, I mean, they are a strong couple together. Which was, which one of the, the characters did you think was more difficult to write, to, to, to create, to give birth to? Tony or Sarah? I know how to write for Stephen. So, um, or, or I think I do. Um, and I knew where I was going with Tony right from the start because I knew, I knew which, which spots I wanted to hit. With, with Sarah, it was more difficult because I don't know Jody as well because she hasn't played a part like this before. And because I was writing about people I knew, my mum's a carer, my mum was a carer, um, and I knew kids from my school who ended up in the caring profession. But getting that line right of her attitude to the world and the way that the, that the place instantly transforms her was something that we were working on all through the process and right through the edit, that actually we had, we had more adjustment time for her in the home in an in the script and as soon as as soon as jody started playing the character we didn't need to do that adjustment anymore you know you're working hard on how will the slipper fit you know that's always the the question you're asking you know that how does the slipper fit you know that you're changing a character that's your job as a dramatist to sort of change a character and the slipper just fitted instantly in a way that felt completely authentic and real and that's all down to Jodie's amazing performance. Your women characters, if we leave a little bit of help, but I mean we have uh, Miriam in Kiri, we have Polly in the accident, we have Sora there in help. This is your connection to women. I mean what is, has your mother been a great influence for you? I mean of course she was a carer in the Sarah case, but I think you're touching um, your women touch is amazing. Um, how much has your mother influenced you when oh. writing women characters? Uh, hugely, but uh, yeah, no, in lots of ways, my mum's influenced me. I don't know, you know, it's a weird thing being a writer and what you're good at and what you're not good at and, and everything else. And um, my, the, my first play I ever wrote, uh, the lead character was a woman. I just like, it, it's just always been something I've done uh, the world is a different place nowadays. And that idea of entitlement and privilege and looking at all those things and going, what, what do you have? What can you write about? And what should you write about? Feels a very important question right now. Mm -hmm. um, I still feel comfortable writing female leads, but there might become a time when that gets questioned. Um, but but it's something I've always done and something I've always been drawn to. And and I love, I mean, I, I, I must say that they become so real. They are never, they, they're never objects. They are really, your women are real women. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Um, you have the ability to make all the characters, women and men, three-dimensional. Um, and, and that also for me, it's like, did you get inspired by somebody during your career that helped you with character based stories in a way or who, who are you inspired with when you write your characters? I, I, I was very lucky in that I was surrounded by the right people when I was starting out as a writer. Um, and uh, that's not just the that's not just the showrunners or the creators or the producers. That's also the actors that you know, I was just put in very lucky situations. The show where I think I learned how to write was uh, Skins. And Skins was 
a show that was all about nurturing talent mm -hmm. and Brian Ailsley who 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 ran Skins uh was a is a, and is a very generous person and gave us a lot of space to fail and a lot of space to try in and listen to us and if there's one thing I think this industry uh needs more of for writers it's it's those shows it's those shows which are helmed by people that are in their hearts um uh, generous and i i'm not one of those people i don't i can't i can't do it as well as brian can do it and i know i can't that i've tried uh, i just I, I know what i want it to be and um and so i'm constantly pushing writers to do what i want um brian was constantly pushing us to do sh what we want and that's a real quality. And we really do need more of brands in this industry. What would you say if you do your analysis, your personal, seeing what the audience is asking for, seeing what is being delivered, give me a little bit of analysis of what, how you think the audiences are reacting to, to, to good drama, to bad drama. What, what do you think people are asking for right now? If you have to do an analysis by your own. It's a really hard question to answer mm -hmm. and 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 you know the the obvious thing to say is the likes of Bridgerton. Do you know what I mean? Like you know, the shows that are real escapism in their hearts that take you to somewhere else and involve you in a new society and go have fun here. You know, uh but if you look at ratings, social realism constantly does well. It's never given credit for doing well. But, you know, in this country, um, the Salisbury Poisonings played last year in the middle of the pandemic. And it was about, uh, you know, a, 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 a nuclear material being found in a, in a, in a town in, in the UK. And it, it did really, really well. And, uh, and so I don't know what the what the answer is to what people are looking for. Similarly, it's a sin, you know, huge hits, looking at something really, really brutal in the middle of this pandemic, you know, and, um, and, and so I don't, I don't know. Uh, uh, but, but I would say people always underestimate social realism in the answer to that question. I see my kids, you know, I see young people, they devour good drama, they devour good documentaries. I think somehow, People are getting serious in a sense that they really want to. Yeah. They want to see help. They want to see Chernobyl. They want to see true-based cases because true reality can be very rich in a in a in a, in a cruel way because it's very cruel to watch. Um, it's yeah, reality all the time. But I think we have. Um, I think the tendencies. I don't know. I think good work with purpose with meaning is being very very attractive right now and I'm so happy that for example help is coming now I I, I think it's gonna be a huge success actually but um, but have you gotten any reviews already I mean I've done some research I've read a little bit of stuff with people that, that have been looking trailers or whatever what what do you think people expect of the show we have had a few reviews come out actually and and they've all been lovely so um let's hope they stay lovely uh I I think that there's there's a very interesting question about whether we should be watching this right now. And there's some people who are saying, um, I'm not ready to, I've, I've suffered too much through COVID. I don't want to watch a drama about COVID. Um, it's cost me too much. T to which, to which I think I, I would say that, that we have to, because what happened to the care home sector was appalling. And I think, I mean, I, I, I don't know what happened in Europe, but I think there have, that there has been similar problems across Europe with the care homes being left. I don't think it's quite as stark as the UK, where frankly, the negligence was criminal. But that, that thing of just going, we will put all people that we aren't worried about dying uh, into this, these places, and we'll just leave them there. Do you know what I mean? You know, and, and we won't give them the resources to support themselves. That's that's a really dangerous act that happened, and and we sort of all walked into it knowingly, and 
in our country, we're going through a lot of questions about social care right now. And Boris claims that he, Boris Johnson claims that he's solved the problem by uh, putting this uh, money on national insurance, which is a regressive tax, not a progressive tax, which is a problem in itself. But also, uh, most of the money is being promised away from social care at a time when, because of Brexit, the the challenges on social care uh, and because of COVID, the challenges on COVID uh, on social care have never been higher. And so we need to be looking at these places because they need our support. And and TV is a campaigning campaigning medium. You know, the, the empathy is a very very powerful tool. And taking someone inside something and going, this is what's happening, um, is really important. So I I hope it gets a wide audience because I'd love people to see it. But I also hope that it leads to questions because I, I really do think questions need to be asked and and I and I still don't see them being asked. I saw some reference to your show to the show. Uh, they were asking if it was based on true facts and I I can read from all the interviews I read with you. Uh, it was really very near the truth, wasn't it? Because you were yeah. really researching from everywhere. So it's not based on true story, but it's based on the true life of what Ex happened. Exactly, exactly. And, and, uh, and it, yes, it was based on the testimony of many, many carers, mm -hmm. um, who told us their stories very, um, uh, very, very openly in a, in a way that was, 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 uh, very raw and very true. And, you know, we have people that we talked to crying down the phone line at us, crying over zoom at us because they were still going through this, uh, this tragedy um, and there was some stuff that we couldn't put in the show because we were prevented from doing it but for legal reasons you know some of the stories we were told were frankly worse uh, um, about about negligence and uh, it, yeah it was frightening. Jack why did you choose or I mean it was a channel town for but they choose to do one film a feature film or I mean do we call it a feature film because it's a one-off why didn't we do a series of it because it's like there's a lot of material there too there is to there is but but but, it, but it's sort of about I think when you're looking for a series you're looking for tentacles going in lots of different directions with this I felt like it was a very direct story that could be told very directly um, the other consideration, thinking as a producer, was that um, getting time with Stephen and Jody is very tough, and so uh, and so, not making it too much of a commitment for them um, meant that, that that we we would have their eyes upon it. Uh, so uh, both those things really, but um, but 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 more that it felt like this was the right the right way of telling this story. Uh, were you involved when were you write your scripts? I guess it's been different in different periods of your life. Um, do you do you go in and work with the director and the editing at the end, or when do you say voila, this is what you, I want you to do, and then you let them work alone? When 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 do you leave it? When you do you leave the baby and let it grow? I'm not as involved as some writers. I I'm not someone that feels comfortable on set. I find being around people very difficult. So um, I, I don't I don't really sit on set and, and take everything in. But it depends on the production, that question as to when you leave the baby alone. Uh, on help, I was working with Mark Munden. It's the third thing we've made together. I I I think Mark is uh, touch with true genius. And I think in television, very few can touch him. So that question is to go, uh, you know, we developed the script together. He knew exactly what he was shooting and why. And uh, and he's an author. And so there was a sort of passing the baton of authorship on and going, now you do your thing. And there are notes I give through the edit process to Mark. There's also a lot of sort of uh, dealing with other people's notes and going, you know, Shh, let, let Mark do his thing. Um, but then on other projects, you have to get quite heavily involved because there are problems or because uh, people aren't as experienced or, or 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 a whole variety of things. And in those situations, um, you know, yeah, I do. I roll up my sleeves and I try and do my bit. And I think it's good if you can delegate and just 
go back and just enjoy whatever happens. Well, that's my point. That's my point about show running. That thing of just going, you know, that you, you want people to be able to do what they do. And Mark Munden is the best. So the idea of sitting on a chair and going, are you sure about that shot, Mark? It doesn't doesn't appeal to me because it's getting in the way of what he does. And he needs to be free to think his own thoughts in the same way that he's not sitting behind me on my sofa as I'm writing and going, are you sure about that? Do you, know, you know, freedom is important. Creative freedom is important. And that idea of limiting people all the time by saying, this is what I think and you have to follow what I think, I don't think is, is productive. And that's why I think you all geniuses get together because you understand each other in a way which i think is fantastic i thought it was very cute going back to your early life when you dis described firstly you love you're passionately in love with television and the possibilities and the little box uh, coming in the room and sitting with your mother and you talk warmly about east enders as the show yeah. that really marked your life why was east enders such a, such a such an important show for you in your life. Well, when I was growing up, it was on twice, and then and then it was on three times a week. So it wasn't quite the all encompassing thing that it is now. Um, and I just my mum's a Cockney. My mum's from uh, Harold Worldston, um, and uh, which isn't actually quite Cockney, but you know she's a Londoner and. Um, and my dad's from Walthamstow, uh, which is uh, a bit further east and up. And so uh, there was that. There was that sort of recognition. But more than that, that thing of just being part of characters' lives for that length of time just really appealed to me. I loved, I mean, I, I would... My wife always says that I have no critical faculty whatsoever and that basically if it's on television, then I'll watch it and I'll have quite a nice time. I won't sit there going, oh, why did they choose that? I'll just sit there going, oh, it's TV. It's lovely. I love it. Um, uh, and uh, and when I was a kid, I just I just wanted to watch as much as possible. And my 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 parents thought they were I was wasting my time, but they were wrong. It was sort of the most important thing I did. Uh, you know, that thing of watching four or five hours a night was actually probably the the more important for me than school uh uh in terms of the cool. career i then chose um uh but 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 yeah no eastenders boys from the black stuff um this life uh you know th those shows just did something to my soul and uh and i love them to this day and you said something that is like they they meant conversation i mean that was yeah watching television was talking which i think also is a a ground society thing between kids and the parents. Uh, I wonder what you will be watching with your son in the wow. near future. Yeah. You know, I mean, no, we 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 watch we watch um we're watching a series of films on Disney Plus about Tinkerbell <laughs> the fairy. So uh, that's where that's where we're at. And uh, and I do try and talk with him afterwards. Uh, we're having a very good time reading at the moment. We're reading The Worst Witch, and that is leading to interesting conversation. Uh, I don't try and push it too much, but uh, but yeah, no, I think that thing of just you know that 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 through other people, through other people's stories, we can talk about our own lives in a way that allows us to be a bit unfettered. I, I think is true. You know, it, it's definitely true. And I think it was uh, as a very awkward teenager, an incredibly awkward teenager. I think it was really useful for me to talk about other people's problems with my mum because I certainly couldn't talk about my own. Um, but through talking about other people's problems I felt a little less lonely you know um I have I have um uh be good uh, tattooed on my wrist because um and my son is called Elliot because E.T. uh just made me feel like there might be someone out there for me even if it is an alien and uh and I think that's what stories do they just kind of they put you in a context they and they and they put your problems in a context I, I think that um all the stories you have written do have a context, do have absolutely conversation possibilities. I think help will help. I think we will open the world. I think what you're doing with with your speech, with your work, with Gray Eye, uh, with disabled people that will, I hope, reach um, a level of natural 
life. I mean, it, it's it's amazing that we have to start. We have to 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 to, to really demand things that should be there. Uh, before we 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 end, I would love you to talk to me about Jenny V. A bar and the work you're doing with her, because I, I think it's also very important. What are you planning, you two? Uh, so we've just done, uh, I love Genevieve. Um, so Genevieve was in that play I wrote for Grey Eye um, years ago. She was also in a TV show I wrote called The Fades, uh, playing a small part. And then I wrote a larger part for her in The Accident and got to know her a little bit and found out she was interested in writing. And so when um, this show Crypt Tales came up um, and Matt Fraser was looking for writers for this um, these 10 minute shorts for the BBC, I said, um, he, he asked me whether I'd write one. And I said, yes, of course. And I said, and can Genevieve write one? Because I think she's got it. I think she's, I, th I think she's an interesting talent. And I, from the way I talk to her, I think she's got that sort of storytelling gene in her. And he said, of course. And she wrote a monologue for Ruth Maidley. And then, and she smashed it. She did a brilliant job. And so um, then I was given the opportunity to write a piece about the Disability Discrimination Act. And I said, absolutely, I'll do it. But I'd like to co-write with Genevieve. Um, and it was sort of my way of kicking her career on a bit of being a sort of mentor in a more active way. And, uh, and then... Um, and then, of course, that thing happened where you realise that she's brilliant. And so I wasn't uh, kicking her career on. I was kicking me own, my own career on. And uh, yeah. and uh, and uh, and so it's been a partnership that's sort of gone on. We're do, we've just we're just writing a project for Jonathan King about the Gallaudet uh, University strike in America, and we're sort of cooking some other projects. But yeah, no, we 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 write together. Um, quite a bit and uh and we talk every day and uh and her career is going to be stellar because uh she's she's just a fantastic writer and uh and um you know I'm really pleased to have played a small part in it and uh and I think probably uh that's what I will do a bit more of um in the next few years is just uh I think co-writing is a way that I can help and and i think it's good for me and i think it's good for them in terms of you know that the, the the channels have got the sort of protection of a more established writer in me um uh but they're supporting um new and exciting talent that's amazing what projects do you have now before we close down today what are you working with now what's on the pipeline in your life uh so two things one is um uh, I did a film last year called Enola Holmes, and uh, and we're just about to start shooting the sequel, Enola Holmes Two. So that's been a lot of a lot of um, my last few months. And then there's a project called Best Interests, uh, which I'm writing for uh, the BBC, um, which is about uh, disability, um, and it's about uh, parents uh, navigating a situation in which. Uh, a hospital decides that their child should be um, that they should cease medical treatment for their child, and it's about the argument, the legal argument about what's best for, but what's best for this disabled child, and so it's really cheery, um, uh, and uh, uh, but you know, no, it's 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 uh, looking at something that's really hard to look at, but um, but I hope we found a way of telling it that will humanize it and and allow people to understand the stakes of these these discussions and it's also based on stories you've heard and yeah absolutely and, and meeting people and and seeing their seeing what they're going through in, in relation to all these things yeah i don't know how to thank you for all this time i don't i don't know how to thank you for the work you're no, doing thank you you're, you're you've been very very kind be. So we can be active helping you with your organizations, with your amazing work, and uh, of course promoting um, your work because that's that's what it's all about. Said you said you love the kind of drama you do, and we really want to to give you a big thank you. I want you to tell us more about your kid in the future and see what he picks on if it's Harry Potter and social realism in another way. 
and say hi to Jody and Steven because the growth and help is amazing. I hope the show goes really, really well. Thank you. Uh, thank you so, so much, Jack. Thank you so, so much. Really nice talking to you. Really nice talking to you. I'm going to go and buy your t shirt now. <laughs> <I promise. laughs> Cheers. Thank you, Jack. Zero, zero.